Hi there, my name is Father Steve Macias. I'm the rector here at St. Paul's Anglican Church in Los Altos. And today I'm going to talk about two countries, and specifically uh, their relation to our faith tradition, which is Anglican. Many people recognize that Anglicanism comes from this place, England, Church of England. And when I describe myself as an Anglican, most people think I have some strange obsession with uh, Anglophilia, or perhaps that I worship the Queen, or that I didn't quite get the memo on the American Revolution. But the reality is that there is no church more American than this guy, the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church, of course, is the Church of the Founding Fathers. It's the Church of the American Revolution. It's the Church of George Washington. And many of our founding principles as a nation for establishing our law and our culture are found in our heritage as a descendant of the Church of England. Now, many of the stories of American history and religious history in America begin at Plymouth Colony with the Pilgrims. But Christianity in America actually begins with English influence on the West Coast, closer to where I am here near San Francisco, where Sir Francis Drake, circumnavigating the world, lands himself in Drake's Bay. 1579, he finds himself behind the wheel of the Golden Hind ship and lands about 20 miles that way. He gets off, his chaplain begins to give thanks to God for the safe passage and exploration so far using a strange book. One that was only recently, according to Sir Francis Drake's timeline, recently made available. That is the Book of Common Prayer. Now that Book of Common Prayer is the foundation of what it means to have an Anglican spirituality. But in 1579, it looked a little bit different. The 1579 Christians were under this book. This is the 1559 Elizabethan Book of Common Prayer. And this is the book that was read there in the San Francisco Bay, which was for a long time called Drake's Bay, and is commemorated even to this day by a several story tall stone cross where not a Roman Catholic or not a Orthodox, but an Anglican service was the first one of the Christian communion services read in North America. But most historians pick up with the story of American Christianity on the East Coast. They recognize that Sir Francis Drake stopped off but got back onto his boat. And so the story of Anglicanism in America might rightfully begin at Jamestown. In 1607, when three ships and 100 people establish, for the sake of the royal crown, a colony. And amongst them was a English priest, an Anglican priest named Reverend Robert Hunt. And he was to here set up for the Anglican service with a crude altar, with a sail suspended between trees, where he celebrated communion again from the Book of Common Prayer not much differently than Sir Francis Drake's chaplain had done on the other side of the country, or at this point, at the other side of the continent. Now, Jamestown had a lot of difficulty, but what was established there was a reflection of Anglican religious culture, or English religious culture, so much that this first colony established a Christian system of legal code. Uh, I say Christian legal code because inside of it was the prescription of religious identity into the daily life of those who belong to Jamestown. Now I'm going to ask you for the sake of this conversation to put aside your views on world exploration or colonialism or the influence of Western cultures on natives, just so we can have a discussion about the history of this particular church in North America. Because what we see very quickly with the English arriving there in Jamestown is the establishment of a Christian penal code. The first one, where the governor was Sir Thomas, Dray, uh, Sir Thomas Dale, began to be known as Dale's Laws, where all military men were to see to it that God was served every day. That no one was to speak against the Trinity. Uh, that's a blasphemy law. And they were not to speak against the Articles of the Church of England. 
To do so, to commit a blasphemy against the Church of England was seen as a capital offense. Again, punishing religious crimes became an important part of this religious community. To disrespect the clergy was to earn yourself a whipping publicly or to have to give a public apology at church on that upcoming Sunday. Every person was to attend services twice each day. Now, we are probably familiar with most Christian traditions requiring service attendance on Sunday, but this is unique to Anglican identity that twice daily worship is a reflection of that Book of Common Prayer because Thomas Cranmer establishes morning and evening prayer, and this cultural imprint is put into Jamestown, where not only are you supposed to be a good Christian and be on your best manners and respect the religion, but you had to go to worship and say the prayers of morning prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, say the prayers from evening prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. So this early you know, group of 100 at Jamestown were a little English monastery, daily going about between the trees with this sail, with this crude altar, with its little cross and its priest saying the prayers from the 1559. Now, with the government here in Jamestown comes the invention of a unique part of American Anglicanism. That is the vestry. Now, many of us in American Christianity are familiar with vestries, especially those who belong to Episcopal or Anglican churches. This is our elder board. This is our board of governors. The vestry is largely laity who are elected and serve as wardens, junior wardens, uh, and handle the finances and the government of the church. They might work on calling the next priest even, but they represent the interest of the laity working with the diocese. Now, at this point in Jamestown, all of the churches uh, are, are very small. Uh, the institution of the colonial church will spread from Virginia and begin to grow. But the institution of the vestry will remain with the American church. Uh, many of you recognize, because of our uh, common polity with the Roman Catholic Church, that the Church of England is traditionally established into diocese with a bishop over a diocese and various priests, rectors and curates and all those sort of assistings like deacons meant to rule over or reign over or govern for the church. The colonial church with its vestries would be under the single diocese of London all the way up to the Revolutionary War. So there'd be one bishop over the entire American colonial system. Now, remarkably, that bishop would never visit the United States. It's a remarkable thing because Anglicans have a idea that priests have to be consecrated by a bishop, and Anglicans have this idea that you're supposed to be confirmed by a bishop physically laying hands on an individual. And we have a lot of years between 1607, when Jamestown is established, and 1760s, 1770s, when the American Revolution goes into full swing. So the American Episcopal Church, or the American Anglican Church, is a strange beast straight from the get-go. But it also is born at a time where exploration of the world is a significant happening as well. Two events that I want to focus your attention on is uh, the Reformation happening on the continent. So keep in mind that this is fairly contemporary with the uh, Continental Reformation of Luther, of Calvin, of uh, the idea of the Protestant Reformation happening on the continent is 1500s, and we're talking about the 1600s. So the Reformation is still in full swing, not just in the Church of England, but throughout the world. And so the idea of a church establishing its identity is really more fluid than at any other time where expiration would have happened. If this American Episcopal Church had been established a few hundred years earlier, American Christianity would look way different than it does today. Now, the establishment of the church in America came with the impetus towards missionary work. Some of you are familiar with the famous story of Pocahontas and John Smith. And this is uh, an important part of uh, Anglican history as well. 
because what we see is that the Church of England also had its view that the Powhatan people, where Pocahontas' tribe is from, uh, should be converted to Christianity. That the hope of Christ saving all people, all people, all skins, all colors, all languages, saving all people would be a message that the Church of England would bring to the natives. And Pocahontas, for all of its romanticization and exaggeration and hagiography, truly was a daughter of a chief. Truly was converted and baptized by the Anglican Church. Uh, her baptismal priest was the Reverend Alexander Whitaker. She later married a tobacco, uh, <coughs> a tobacco planter named John Rolfe, and she eventually went back to England with him. But this began not just a missionary uh, voyage of converting the natives, which was not just Native Americans, but also Jews who had moved to the American colonies, who the Church of England thought that they would have a chance at converting here in America. One of uh, my favorite stories is how English missionaries would learn Spanish once they got to the colonies to convert the Jews who had moved to escape persecution in Europe to the United States. Uh, but that's, that's not directly related to the establishment of the Church of England. But the Church of England, from the very beginning, was established in Virginia. All right, we have Jamestown. Uh, but there is something significant about Virginia. Virginia is the home of America's greatest Anglican figures. Washington, George Washington, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson. And they helped establish an institution, or they helped preserve and protect an institution that really underpinned the reason why the American Revolution happened. Uh, we've often thought that the American Revolution was about us getting rid of monarchy, and that was not really the objective of the American colonists. There was no objection amongst the Anglicans with the idea of the king. In fact, the king was often seen as a, a blessing uh, for them. But Washington, Henry, Jefferson were also members not of their not only of their particular parishes where Washington served as a vestryman, but they were also members of civil government, particularly the Assembly of Burgesses. Now, the Assembly of Burgesses is one of these early colonial legislative systems that worked in tandem with the state governor to protect the rights of that colony and balance them against the king. So the colonial system was not this monarchical dictatorship where the king said, give me money, and then the colonies would give it up, or the king would say, you're now my soldier. It didn't work that way. The king granted a charter to Virginia and established a governor, and the governor was the execu executive of that charter. Now, his power was supposed to be balanced against a legislative body of people who lived in that territory. It was very similar to the system that they had in the churches the bishop would establish a rector to govern the church, and the members of that church would elect amongst themselves legislative officers, senior warden, junior warden, who would handle the finances and the properties and eventually pick the future uh, direction of that church. So you can see that the vestry and the House of Burgesses were similar or parallel organizations reflecting their uh, identity as subsidiarity government organizations in conjunction with bishops on one side, in conjunction with kings on the other side. They recognize this necessary balance of power. But what happened is in England, a, another institution stepped on the toes of this procedural order. That is the parliament. The parliament interposed itself between the king and the colonies. Now, each colony was granted its charter not by parliament, but by the king, and therefore felt responsible or only under the authority of the king directly. The king appointed the governor, the people appointed their own legislative body. Parliament was for England. Now, some of you are familiar with the French and Indian War and how parliament attempted to pay for that war by levying taxes from parliament over the colonies. This sounds familiar because this exact same issue is going to come up with the Stamp Act, it's going to come up and be the source over and over again of the consternation of the American colonialists against the king and his parliament. 
The king was supposed to protect the colonies from the parliament, failed to do, therefore broke the covenant between the charter. Now, there's a group here missing that we haven't talked about. Uh, if we talk about early American Christian identity, you have to talk about Plymouth Rock. You have to talk about the pilgrims. You have to talk about how they were escaping the persecution religiously of the king and his bishops, right? Well, that's true. In 1620, after Jamestown, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock and established uh, what would be eventually the Massachusetts colony, right? So this idea of a Puritan commonwealth. Now, one of the criticisms of the Puritan commonwealth is that it patterned its laws off of the Old Testament ceremonial and moral laws. Some of the strictest parts of this were related to civil penalties for Sabbath breaking. And these were eventually called the Puritan Blue Laws and have some examples here. But they were very detailed because they wanted their commonwealth, which the Puritans of this period called the, quote, New Zion, as a reference to the Zion of the Old Testament, to have God's covenantal blessing, which they believed was responsible, uh, which was the result of our responsibility towards our ethical covenant with God. That the people in the new commonwealth had made a covenant, an agreement, a contract for, with God that if they obeyed his laws, they would receive his blessings. Much like we see in the book of Deuteronomy given to the old people. If you experience my obedience, you experience blessings. If you disobey, you'll experience the cursings. And so setting up a civil penal system is how they enforced or encouraged that blessing. So some examples are very similar to what we see amongst the Pharisees uh, in Christ's time, that no person shall cross a river on Sunday unless he is a clergyman. Now, obviously, this is a reference to the idea of not working on the Sabbath day, which uh, is, of course, an important part of Christianity. But this is taking it a step further. Don't even cross the river, because that might be an excuse to go to work. No man shall run or walk in his garden on Sunday. So this is very strict Sabbatarianism. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with this, but when you take it to be the civil responsibility, you are now taking a religious identity into your civil government. The civil government of the Plymouth Commonwealth was Puritan. It was not for the sake of religious toleration. It was for the establishment of a Puritan New Zion. So with that came religious exclusion, not toleration. So much that things like the Book of Common Prayer were explicitly banned and made criminal. For example, uh, no minister shall perform a marriage. Right? No minister shall perform a marriage. Well, in the Church of England, the Roman Church, the Orthodox Church, all of the traditional Western and Eastern churches, marriages were performed by ministers. Here the Puritans are collapsing those separate categories and saying that marriage shall be done by the civil magistrate. Now this is interesting because it reflects what's happening in the continent in the Reformation. Right? How did John Calvin become established as the pastor in Geneva? Well, in Switzerland, the civil magistrate appointed the pastor. The civil magistrate was receiving the blessing of God and therefore had the authority to establish rites and ceremonies. Now, it's interesting because I would make the argument that that's nearly identical to the argument for monarchy, for the divine right of king. But, not the point. The point here is that the Puritans are establishing a religious commonwealth for the propagation of their non-conformity, a rejection of Anglicanism, a rejection of Roman Catholicism, a rejection of church tradition and ceremony for what they believe to be a purified form of Christianity. Now this was, uh, in actuality, a radical shift in Christianity because things like the Book of Common Prayer may have been new, but they included traditions that were thousands, 1,200, 1,400, 1,600 years old at this time. Things like celebrating Christmas or singing songs on the Sunday service. The Puritans allowed no instruments except for drums, trumpets, or what they called the Jews' harp. Everything else was too secular. Now, to the Puritans, this was, again, about, about establishing their ethical identity. But what happened to 
the interactions then. If you have Jamestown and now Virginia colony growing, and you have people visiting from the continent, you have Plymouth colony now growing, what happens when those type of Christians interact here in the New World? Well, when you visited a Puritan colony, you would be subjected to Puritan laws. For example, Thomas Morton was driven out of one of these early colonies because he was, quote, of a gay humor. Uh, the idea was Christianity is serious business, not, not happy business. There was also confusion because he was in possession of a Book of Common Prayer, which was <laughs> paraphernalia of sacrilege. Now, there was another man, uh, Reverend, Reverend Robert Jordan, who was put in prison because of that law against performing marriages. It was a crime for a minister to celebrate a marriage according to the Book of Common Prayer. Not just because of the words that were said, but because of the ceremonies attached to it. The idea of man-made ceremony being, quote, repugnant to God. Especially the idea of exchanging of wedding rings, which were blessed during the marriage ceremony. The Puritans thought that was just Roman Catholic superstition. Now, this is uh, not just an Anglican versus Puritan or, or conformist versus nonconformist issue. Other religious sects were also persecuted by the Puritans. For example, the Quakers uh, were marred and mutilated by the pilgrims because of their religious identity. If you were a Quaker and you showed up in a, a, a pilgrim town, a, a Puritan town, you could find your ear cut off and sent out of town for your strange views. It was a crime to, to host the Quakers or to hide them. And if you got caught a second time, they would do something where they would drill a hole through your tongue so that you couldn't propagate your heresy anymore. So all that to say, each of these religious institutions, whether you're Puritan or, or Anglican, in the New World were fighting for their own cultural identity. Uh, often this myth of religious toleration is purported as the goal of the Puritans, which was not the case. In fact, the Puritans themselves, both in Scotland, England, and the New World, thought toleration was a bad word. They said, quote, it's like putting a sword into the hands of a madman or a cup of poison into the hands of children. Uh, they saw it as giving Christ's religion to the wolves. And so for the Puritans, they wanted to overthrow the polity, the church government, and the ceremony and the formality of Western Christendom for the sake of their Reformation identity. Now, this is important because up till here, this is not just an issue in the colonies, but from the century prior, the Puritans had been in constant, con constant conflict with the established Church of England. Uh, one example that we can get into that will give us some insight on understanding the distinctions between the Puritans and the Anglicans in the New World has to do with a bishop named Hooper. Now, Hooper was elected bishop, and he had in his uh, personal convictions, sentiments that were more aligned with the Puritans. Theologically, he was what we describe as more reformed in his view. So much that he didn't want to put on the vestments, the strange clerical clothing that was required for when you were consecrated a bishop. He saw that this was a man-made ceremony or a man-made tradition that couldn't be proven to be required by the scripture, therefore he didn't want to submit to it. Now, this is uh, an important distinction because it demonstrates what's going to be a key difference between Anglican Christians and the rest of Christians throughout the revolutionary and colonial periods. And that is the view of authority. Now, some things in the church are what we describe as adiaphora or things that are not essential. So for some people, uh, what you wear on a Sunday, whether it's something like this, like a collar or a certain stole, are things indifferent, adiaphora. But there are other things that are more essential, like the creeds or the incarnation uh, or certain prayers. And what do you use and do when these things conflict? How do you handle issues of adiaphora? Now, the Anglican view was if something is not directly directly commanded by Scripture, but carries the weight of tradition, it is the authorities 
responsibility to establish custom, which means in the Church of England, it was the bishops and the king who could speak to things indifferent. So if the issue of vestments came up, should I wear this surplus, this white gown? Should I wear this stole, this scarf-like thing that goes over me? Should I wear a, a, a hat or any type of headdress? If that is a matter of indifference, adiaphora, then we bounce it back up to the bishops and they get the final say. We bounce it up to the king, they get final say. Now, in the Reformation, there's another idea they introduced, the idea of the individual and his conscience. That religious became an individual idea, so much that down to the church itself should be a matter of individual conscience. And this is where Ju uh, John Hooper, this bishop-elect, is coming from. My conscience says I shouldn't have to wear this. Therefore, because of my religious affinity, that this is a personal relationship with my God, between me and God. That the covenant is based on my righteousness, based on Christ's imputation of righteousness. That who is the church to add ceremony, add custom, add tradition to that? This uh, distinction is really what separates uh, the, the vestment controversy. But what Hooper is told is wear it anyway. Even though your conscience may disagree with it, even though you may not be convinced that in things indifferent, you submit to the authority that God has put over you. And some may say, well, of course, they followed church tradition. But it was men like John Calvin uh, and the Continental Reformers that agreed with this sense that when it comes to matters indifferent, the individual should bow his conscience to the authority. Now, that's because if you do not bow your conscience in times of indifference, uh, then you're not going to have the same power or authority to speak on things that actually matter. See, for men like Calvin, they were talking about the doctrine of justification, the idea of salvation by faith. And they thought those were so essential that we need to find common ground there, that those were the matters that were related to salvation. And those were the battles worth fighting, not over which vestments to wear. It also spoke to his view of authority, of the tradition of the church having value in interpreting how the scripture is read. Anybody who's read Calvin's Institutes can recognize that the patristics hold a great amount of weight in Calvin's thinking and should, in the minds of those who call themselves the successor of Calvin, hold weight. But that is really the background between the conflict between the colonies like Jamestown and the colonies like Plymouth, where you have conformity to the Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England and non-conformity, Puritanism. So when this reign continues, this, this history continues, we have Anglicanism grow, especially under the reign of Charles II. Charles II, uh, came to the throne and established something called the Clarendon Code, which basically was an act of conformity that extended even to the colonies, extended into all throughout England. And this is uh, the, the idea that the Book of Common Prayer should be the standard of the Church of England, and its ceremonies should be the standard of all English peoples, to which the colonies associated themselves with. Now, this meant that the prayer book tradition was given a foothold, especially in colonial America. Places that were established originally as Puritan colonies, now, because of the ascendancy of Charles II and the Clarendon Code, had an advantage. So when Anglicanism came to various other colonies, it was the, quote, established church. It was the established tradition. It was the religion of America even though it coincided or coexisted with these various Puritan sects. So one specific and significant church in this history, uh, in the progression of American Anglicanism, is King's Chapel. Now, King's Chapel was built in 1689. It's later called Christ Church. Now, this is the one that's famous, made famous by Paul Revere. This is the Christ Church that Paul Revere's famous ride is uh, held in conjunction with. But following the establishment of the church 
in Boston with King's Church, uh, with Christ Church. Anglicanism had a really easy time spreading throughout the rest of the Northeast. It established a foothold in Maine and New Hampshire, and it was able to become uh, really a predominant faith church, even though it was a little bit different than it was in England. They established their own vestries, they had no bishop visitation, but it spread and it remained the popular religious thought of those who were involved with civil government and even the revolutionary uh, documentation. Some of the other colonies that are uh, important to mention here, for example, Rhode Island is an important one because Rhode Island is formed when Roger Williams is expelled by the Puritans from Massachusetts. So this is a little bit before King's Chapel is built in 1636. Roger Williams is one of these guys who talks about this sharp distinction between uh, church affairs or religious affairs and state affairs. Uh, this is an idea that didn't really exist in Anglican colonies and it didn't exist in Puritan colonies. You know, the Anglicans had the burgesses and the vestries, the Puritans had their blue laws, and they had their governors as well. So they both recognized that our religious identity impacted our state identity. But Williams wanted uh, a truly tolerant uh, <laughs> commonwealth, so he established a colony which welcomed what he described as all Christians except for Roman Catholics. And so following Williams' ideas, the government was set up around these principles of church and state separation. And that meant that churches like the Church of England or the Anglican Church was able to come into Rhode Island as well and be another one of the churches. You know, so this is one of the reasons why America has this strange phenomenon of having you know, one street with you've got the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church, the Baptist Church. Because in this foundational period, these churches were allowed to form together. There's kind of this democratization of identity. People were able to choose where they go. And Fortunately for the Anglican tradition, most people were coming and stayed with what they were familiar. Significant to the spread of Anglicanism in the Northeast is the church in Connecticut. So Connecticut became uh, one of the strongest footholds for Anglicanism in the Northeast. And today, Connecticut has a number of Episcopal churches uh, compared to places where I live like California. And that's largely because of a man named Timothy Cutler. Now, Timothy Cutler was a Congregationalist, which was a, a polity embraced by the Puritans, and he was the rector, or the, the head, of Yale College. Now, at one point, Cutler and six other faculty mem members at Yale met for discussions on theology. You know, this is kind of like what we see with the inklings of men getting together and having their conversations. So, at Yale, they had a similar group, led by Cutler, and they became interested as Congregational Puritans in the big fuss over the Book of Common Prayer. And <laughs> keep in mind that here at this time, uh, at Yale College, the Book of Common Prayer was contraband. To be interested in what it was doing was looked down upon as kind of flirting with another church's tradition because of the great battle between the conformists and the nonconformists, between the Puritans and the Anglicans, between the Clarendon Codes and the, the idea of freedom of religion. But here in Connecticut, they were so impressed here at Yale College with the Book of Common Prayer that they announced to the trustees that they were leaving to return to the Anglican Church and three of them went on to England and were ordained as priests in the Church of England. Now, one of these men uh, was a famous figure that we know in American history, which was Samuel Johnson, who returned back to Connecticut after being ordained and established an Anglican church there. And then he would later go to New York and start King's College, which today is now known as Columbia. So what we recognize today as kind of these liberal arts schools that are very influential in our history came out of the influence of the Book of Common Prayer here at Yale College. Now, New York became uh, an important Anglican institution or state as well. Obviously, New York, York being an English name itself. But you knew New York was originally established as a Dutch colony. Some of you know New Amsterdam. 
But the Dutch colonists allowed the Anglins, Anglicans to worship after their service was over. So uh, some of you know that before the Puritans, before the pilgrims came to America, they tried to go to the Netherlands, right? So they left England, they went to the Netherlands, and the Netherlands, they found, the Puritans found that the culture was just too liberal. There was too much toleration, and they were afraid that if their kids grew up in the Netherlands as Dutch, that they'd become strange secular thinkers. So that's why they came back to the United, to England to then go to North America. Well, the Dutch who had settled in New York, New Amsterdam, had the similar sense of toleration. They allowed the Anglicans to worship there alongside of them. And even, uh, even that speaks to kind of uh, the culture that existed here in New York and North America. But significantly in New York, Trinity Parish is uh, what we need to focus on. Trinity Parish was incorporated in 1705. Queen Anne gave the Queen's Farm. Sorry, let me say that one more time. So Trinity Parish uh, became an important, important parish in New York. Uh, Trinity Parish faced itself serious financial problems, but in 1705, Queen Anne gave them the Queen's Farm, which solved Trinity's financial problems. Today, much of Wall Street is located on this land, and Trinity Church is one of the richest churches in the world. Now, that's uh, true even to today. Throughout all of American history, Trinity Church, because of this donation of land, has become a significant, wealthy parish. Now, Maryland itself was established under this idea of religious freedom, and so the Church of England had no problem establishing Anglican churches there. So the, the picture you get is the people who settled in these colonies, a very small number of them are there for religious purposes. Most of the people who are here in the New World are bringing with them the religion that they came with. And so Anglican churches are popping up. Anglican priests are coming to be missionaries to serve the people who are moving here and settling here. And also, as we see with the Jews and the natives, to convert them. But this kind of groundwork really begins to fall apart with the revolutionary uh, movement. So there's problems uh, that start to arise with the colonial church. Now, we're going to talk about parliament, we're going to talk about government, and then we'll talk about ultimately the separation of the American Anglicans from the English Anglicans. But one of the major problems uh, was the lack of American bishops. So why were there not dioceses established in the United States, right? Like you could establish charters for an entire commonwealth, the commonwealth of Virginia. They could have at the same time sent over a bishop and established the Bishop of Virginia, of the Church of England. And they could have gone about doing confirmations and establishing new clergy, except there was opposition to this. So one part of this is the governor saw a bishop, uh, the governor of a colony saw the bishop as a competing authority. And so there was opposition to that. The other part was that those who lived in American colonies had been influenced largely by dissenters or, or nonconformists who didn't want the king's, what they described as the king's toadies or the king's uh, authority to be expressed even further in America by the establishment of bishops. There's also the issue of finance. Because the Church of England finances itself through the state, well, then the Church of England pays the priests and the bishops. So if you were a colonial government in Virginia and some of your people are Presbyterian and some of your people are uh, Congregationalists and some of them are an Anglican, well, the Presbyterian members of the House of Burgesses don't want to pay for a bishop uh, for the Diocese of Virginia. So there was a number of factors that were contributing to the lack of bishops in the Americas. The same thing was happening in England, where English people were opposing the idea of spending their money on uh, American bishops. They should take care of it themselves. Now, uh, this is uh, very important, but what we need to recognize, and I've said this earlier here, is that meant that for all of the American churches, 
So whether they were in what we've mentioned so far, like Connecticut or New York or Virginia, all of these Americans spread out, which by the revolution include South Carolina, uh, well, the Carolinas, uh, include Georgia, all of these areas where we have traditional Anglican parishes are all under the same bishop, all under the same diocese, the Diocese of London. And so they have established a system of commiss uh, commissaries, commissaries. And in order to coordinate authority, the Bishop of London assist, created a system of appointing clergymen who lived in the colonies to represent the authority of the bishop in those colonies. So these commissaries, uh, where the Church of England was the established church of a colony, would have a convention of that colony to handle a discipline. So if you had a, a rogue clergyman or a heretical clergyman, these commissaries would carry the authority of the Bishop of London to discipline rogue clergy or misbehaving clergy. Uh, and so this created a kind of pseudo-episcopal office inside of the American system, right? Because these were men who now represented the legislative or ecclesiastical authority of the Bishop of London in the United States. They were the stand-ins for the bishop's authority. And some significant men came out of this system. Two of them that I want to mention are James Blair and Thomas uh, Thomas Bray. So James Blair was the commissary for Virginia, and he was, by all accounts, a champion of the Church of England in Virginia, or the Anglican Church in Virginia. He is the guy who founded William and Mary College, and he also served as its first president. So this is the great uh, kind of Anglican foothold and figure, but represents a unique political office in American Anglicanism or American Episcopalianism. Now, Blair upheld the rights of clergy, uh, and he did a great deal to raise the moral standards of clergy in the colonies, expecting great things from clergymen who were out in the Wild West, right, in the New World. Another man who is a commissary, uh, but is worth mentioning, was Thomas Bray. And so Bray served for the commissary of Maryland, and he promoted religious libraries and religious learning, and he also worked to develop the Anglican Church as the established church in the colony of Maryland. Now, he was deeply concerned with the struggle, right, between the nonconformists and the conformists, between Anglicans and Congregationalists, between all of these various sects that were trying to coexist while being part of the English system, but also representing all of these various religious ideas. And so he returned to England and he established a group called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, SPG. Now, SPG was founded to help establish Anglicanism in the American church. Uh, one of their goals was to get them bishops. And this is uh, important because SPG is going to really direct the growth and trajectory of the American church more than anything uh, throughout the next few, next few generations. Now, the society was founded and the best way it was chosen to help the America was to take a survey of all of these various colonial churches and find out what they need. So they appointed a man named George Keith, and he was to go to the various colonial established churches, whether it was Virginia or Maryland or wherever the Anglicans were in the New World, and find out you know, how do they best support the missionary work of the Anglican Church in the New World. Now, Keith was uh, well-suited because he had lived and grown, uh, grown in the colonies, and he had even been uh, a Quaker in Pennsylvania, and he had converted from being a Quaker to being a priest in the Church of England. He had been convinced that the prayer book system was superior to the strangeness of whatever Quakers believe. And so he was not only a, a convert, uh, but he was an enthusiastic convert. And he wanted to make sure that, uh, that Anglicanism had the greatest reputation it could amongst the colonies. So uh, on the way to America, though, so he goes to establish this, this survey. He meets a 
chaplain on the ship named John Talbot, who becomes interested in the idea of the SPG, the idea of surveying and serving the American churches, and decides to team up with him. So Keith and Talbot traveled throughout the colonies, from Anglican church to Anglican church, preaching, converting, correcting, and uh, they would go themselves to Quaker meetings, and uh, they said to have baptized hundreds of Quakers into the Church of England. So very early on, this mission that was supposed to be fact-finding becomes this evangelical zeal towards you know, bringing people into the fold of the Church of England. Now, after doing his tour, uh, going all the way up and down the colonies, he comes back to England to report his finding to the bishops and to the other members of the society of what does America need for Anglicanism or English Christianity to succeed in its new colonies. And uh, what they needed was priests and money, which is what every church seems to need. But <laughs> what they did uh, after that is focus on church establishment or church planting, as we might call it today. And the church society, the SPG, did more for the American church than any other religious institution could have imagined at this time. So in 40 years, times, uh, 40 years time from the survey beyond this, the society built 100 churches. They distributed 10,000 prayer books and Bibles. They established 310 missionary priests. And this is in you know 17th century. They spent... Uh, a million and a quarter dollars in church ministry. So a ton of money coming out of the society, all meant to support the religious identity of the church as Anglican. Now, all of this growth, new priests, new money, new churches, all establishing up here in colonial America, gave rise and reminded them of their need to have bishops. In order for the church to grow, you got to have confirmations, you know, where people go from being just baptized members to confirmed members so they can uh, really explain the English prayer book. I mean, they're basically having to <laughs> skip over that piece of the Book of Common Prayer that they're handing out to everybody. But it also meant that candidates could not be ordained. So that was a limiting factor on the growth of the church. Anytime they wanted a new priest, they had to train him, send him over to be examined by the English bishops, hope he gets ordained, ship him back. And this is, of course, at a time when a trip across the ocean was not guaranteed. So 3,000 miles from London to uh, whatever English or American colony you're at uh, was a big impediment. So there was a need for bishops. And then again, the dissenters didn't want bishops on American soil, uh, and the bishops had been part of the group that had enforced some of the unpopular uh, political rulings in the old world. And so there was an apprehension amongst the American colonies from the Anglicans and non-Anglicans about the introduction of bishops. Who would pick these bishops? And that was you know, an, an issue in England itself, going way back to the Magna Carta. Does the king pick the bishops? Do the people pick the bishops? Does the pope pick the bishops? What are we inviting into the American Episcopal system with bishops? Now, this means that by the time the Revolutionary War begins, America is still without bishops. And the Anglican Church is still under the Bishop of London. And during the Revolutionary War, this put the American Anglicans in a tough place, right? Because as I've explained, some of the most significant figures, the general and the future president of the American military, George Washington, was an Anglican vestryman and a faithful member of an Anglican church who took that book of prayer out of his pocket every morning and every evening and forced his soldiers to say morning and evening prayer. So how does he reconcile the fact that he's at war with the head of his church? Now, this is a difficult position for a lot of men. So. Many of the leaders beyond George Washington you'll recognize as uh, significant revolutionary figures, but you might not have put them in the bucket of Anglican religious leaders. Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Henry Lee, Robert Morris, Robert Livingston, John Marshall, Anthony Wayne were all baptized members and often vestrymen or leaders 
or pillars of their colonial Anglican churches. In Virginia, two-thirds, though, of the clergy, that's two-thirds of the Anglican clergy, supported not the crown, but the American Revolution. That has to do a lot with this conflict in the French-Indian War, where the House of Burgesses was dissolved by the governor in favor of the parliament. So even the clergy who were loyal to the bishops and to the king recognized, recognized that something was being done incorrectly and that their faith as Anglicans called them to side with the American side over England. Now the church, of course, is part of, is part of uh, the English system. The church owes its loyalty to the king in the Anglican church. And so any clergy who sided with the revolution were basically committing acts of treason against the crown. And so there were many ways that the clergy would write in secret. So they would use uh, pseudonyms, uh, they would write under different names, um, and they would cage their support of the revolution in ways that wouldn't get them deposed or burned or, right? So two thirds of the men who served in the colonial church in Virginia operated in support of the colonists, yet maintained their roles as ministers in the Church of England. Now, a third of those men were loyalists, meaning they thought that the king was right, the parliament should have authority over the colonies. And many of those men ended up leaving uh, the United States after the Revolutionary War, many of them to Canada or back to England. So uh, this, is, this is important because while England is often credited as calling the American Revolution the Presbyterian Rebellion, many, many Anglican ministers themselves were killed, burned, their livelihoods destroyed, their homes burned, uh, things like their horses being blinded. That was done just as frequently to the Anglicans who sided with the American Revolution, which the majority of them did. Now, we want to talk about some uh, some changes that happened because of the revolution, as you as you might imagine that after the revolution, uh, some structuring has to change, because now you can't send your future men, so the society's candidates for holy orders, who are going to plant these hundreds of more churches and spend all this money that's been raised, can't be sent back to the diocese of London to be ordained to come back to America, because they're now two separate countries. Right? So the Bishop of London is not about to start ordaining men and paying their uh, stipends in the United States. So there's a severing that happens, whereas the churches in the United States who were of the Church of England are now a different legal entity than the church in England. How did this happen? How did they do this? Uh, well, initially they wanted to stay together. They wanted the Church of England to grant them their own bishops. Uh, grant them their own autonomous authority. But because of you know, the Clarendon Code, because of Charles II, because of Charles I, because of uh, the conflicts with the Roundheads and, and Cromwell, and all of this history, certain, certain processes had been put in place to prevent clergy from serving against the crown. So for example, in order for you to be ordained as a priest or a bishop, you had to make an oath. And Contrary to how we behave today, oaths are serious business. Oaths say, if I break this, may God's judgment be upon me. And so they couldn't take an oath that says that they were loyal to the crown because the crown no longer had authority over <laughs> the United States. And the parliament and the bishops refused to make an exception for American uh, candidates for the episcopacy. So the church gathers. In the, in the American colonies, the, these Anglicans who are now basically diaspora, right? So these are Anglicans in exile. They're American Anglicans who are no longer welcome in their home church, yet they still use the same prayer book, they still believe the same things, but politically, there's a division. So, in Maryland, remember because Maryland's an established Anglican church, uh, a William Smith, a priest of the church, foresaw the menace uh, 
foresaw the menace to church property at the end of the war and called a conference in 1780 to find a solution to the problem. The conference decided to petition the General Assembly for the right of the church to own property, to handle their own funds, and in order to do this, uh, a name other than the Anglican Church had to be chosen, and the name was Protestant Episcopal Church in America. So what's happening in Maryland during this time is they needed to change their identity so that they could no longer be associated with the English crown who was at war with the American people. And the name they chose was Protestant Episcopal Church in America. Now this is uh, important for a couple of reasons, but Protestant to show that they were not Roman, uh, which was largely an homage back to the Lutheran Reformation, and Episcopal from the Greek episkopos, which to show that they were still Catholic, or uh, they were still holding the traditions of the patristic church, that they had, for example, the episcopate. They still had bishops. Uh, but the American church itself never separated. So this is not like when Henry VIII declares himself head of the church with the, with the Pope. The American church changes its name and alters its identity, but it never breaks communion with the Church of England. Instead, it just updated its, uh, its legal name and moved forward with trying to retie the religious identity without the political structure. Now, in Connecticut, a group of men gathered together uh, because they realized that they needed leadership for the post-war church. Because while they had a great number of clergy who remained behind, priests and deacons, there's no bishop. And without a bishop, the church would flounder and die. Because, again, Anglicans can't make new priests without a bishop. So after this meeting in Connecticut, this convocation got together and they selected a man. His name was Samuel, Samuel Seabury. And you can kind of see right here, this is a, a Seabury pin from the Seabury Society. It has Seabury's mitre there. They had Seabury elected to be the first American bishop. Meaning the convocation of Anglicans in North America said, we want Samuel Seabury to be our first bishop but they needed somebody to consecrate him. So they sent Seabury to England, which said, you can't do that because he can't, <laughs> he can't take our oath. So Samuel Seabury goes hop, skip, and jump away to Scotland, and the church at Aberdeen or, or consecrates Samuel Seabury as a bishop. Now this is, again, one of these complicated things where there's a lot of history here because you have to understand that the Church of Scotland goes through a, a glorious revolution, goes through the Presbyterian kind of conversion where all of the bishops are kicked out of Scotland. And then because of James I, where we get the King James Bible, who was King of Scotland and England, you see a, a reuniting, which is partially why the flag looks like this, having the Scottish flag with the blue and the white X, the uh, flag of St. Andrew with the flag of St. George because of uh, James I's rule over both of these countries. So what happens in English and Scottish history is that bishops are, after the Presbyterian Church of Scotland is established, re-established in Scotland as what's called a non-juring church. And that non-juring church is in communion with the Church of England, but separate. So the, the dilemma that America's having about being separate political entities, right, different countries, yet uh, having common religious communion was solved in Scotland by taking bishops from England and or taking the bishops in Scotland and establishing them as non-juring bishops. And so it is these non-juring Scottish bishops who receive Samuel Seabury, lay hands on him and consecrate him as the first bishop of the Anglican Church for the United States. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, not done lightly. Uh, I think Seabury spent like an entire year working with the folks in England before he decides to go over to Scotland. But down in 1784 becomes a new identity for the American Anglicans. So now the political and religious identity 
of the American church is kind of tied to England, but not politically. So Anglicans from now on are not subject to parliament because of the American Revolution. And Anglicans from here on out are not subject to the king because of the American Revolution. And they're not subject to bishops in the Church of England because of the bishops now trace their succession through the Church of Scotland. So Scotland then becomes the direct influence of the uh, American prayer book tradition, of American Anglicanism. And so that new name uh, that was chosen, the Protestant Episcopal Church, uh, becomes very significant because while the church in England is often called the Anglican Church, the church in Scotland that has communion with the Church of England is called the Scottish Episcopal Church or the Scottish Bishop's Church, Scottish Episcopal Church. And that character falls down into America where we have the Protestant Episcopal Church becomes the legal corporate name of the American institution of Anglicanism. The full name, of course, is Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. And that be, remains the name until the American Civil War, when there's a split, uh, and then reuniting, <laughs> and then uh, until there's a split with the uh, Protestant Episcopal Church and the Reformed Episcopal Church. And then today, the Protestant Episcopal Church has basically dropped the word Protestant and the United States, and they just go by the Episcopal Church. But let's go forward and just talk about uh, the establishment of this new institution. So you have a colonial church that's largely supported by England, now independent. Uh, a lot, n large number of its clergy have left for Canada or for back to England. They have this strange uh, new arrangement with Scotland where their new bishop is uh, consecrated. And now they come back to the United States and begin to carve out an identity for American Episcopalianism. So that happens at the first general convention in Philadelphia, and that's in 1785. So this is you know uh, less than a decade after the uh, Declaration of Independence. And in Philadelphia, which those of you who study American history, this is a significant American event where Reverend William White, who had been closely associated with the leaders of the American Revolution there in Pennsylvania uh, and writers of the Constitution wanted to present a united Anglican identity for the American colonies. Uh, and so they took very a few really important steps. Uh, this, this early church is a little confusing. Uh, I have here a copy of their prayer book, and this is uh, not the best prayer book. Uh, it's a little bit strange. It's largely based on the English 1662, but it makes some, some, some choices uh, that reflect really the religious culture of America uh, in the late 18th century. But uh, first at the convention, letters were written to the bishops in England asking that the, that the American Episcopal Church be recognized. Right? So they didn't want to start a new sect of Anglicanism or a new sect of Christianity. What they wanted was a connection they felt that Aberdeen had given them a connection, and canonically, of course it did, uh, to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There, this isn't a, a division or a sectarianism. They imagined themselves as a communion with America, Scotland, England, uh, and all of whatever England might uh, establish as its own dominions in the future would all be part of this same communion. Uh, communion. Um, and then the English bishops were then asked to consecrate more bishops. Uh, this is kind of like the Anglicans in America saying, well, we've already, we've already got one, so there's already a precedent for our, for our having a bishop. But in order for you to express that you truly do agree that we are the one church, right, that you're Anglicans and we're Anglicans, we're going to ask you to participate in our apostolic succession, by ordaining our next or consecrating our next minister so that it would truly show that the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the, the Scottish Episcopal Church, uh, and the American Episcopal Church were all really one church that they could lay hands on each other and it would be recognized mutually. Um, and then that convention also uh, creates this prayer book, this, uh, this first American prayer book. Uh, now there's... there's two men who are elected as 
uh, bishops from that convention. Uh, White is one of them. And then a man named Provost is also sent uh, to uh, to be consecrated. And another man named Griffith was elected in Virginia. But uh, strangely enough for Bishop-elect Griffith, he couldn't gather enough money to make it to England. And so he was not made a bishop because he couldn't get across the sea. Uh, one of those uh, sad parts of American Episcopal history. Now, they were ordained in the Church of England, or consecrated, I should say, by the Church of England in 1787. And so, in a apostolic succession point of view, the American Episcopal Church had the same exact lineage, meaning the pedigree of the American Episcopal Church had the same validity as the Church of England. Uh, that they weren't, they weren't a stepchild or something else, but were recognized as having the same apostolic line. And they had three bishops, which was what was necessary canonically for them to create more bishops. So from this point on, we would call the church uh, in the United States, the Episcopal Church that's formed here after the Revolutionary War is autocephalous because they have their own, com uh, their own set of three bishops, they have their own churches, they have, they've been given their own territory, and, and they will set their, themselves up with a little bit different structure than the other Anglican churches, but uh, this would be, this would be a independent church. Uh, no queens, no kings. This is the convention of the Episcopal Church, the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States, autocephalous. Now they draw up their, their 1789 prayer book, they put together their constitutions, their canons, they make some changes to the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, some things are significant, um, like they, they said that you could say the Apostles' Creed during Holy Communion, or they took out the phrase, he descended into hell, uh, and they made some changes to the, to the epiclesis, uh, or they added an epiclesis in the canon of the, of the Holy Communion service, and reorganized uh, some of the prayers to match the Scottish Church more than the English Church. So there had been some developments in the prayer book in Scotland that now had made their ways into the American prayer book church. So just around this time, um, as Samuel Seabury is consecrated, the prayer book is revised, um, there's new bishops installed. This is right at the same time where the US Constitution is ratified, because keep in mind, the war happened in 1776, but there's a colonial government, there's Articles of Confederation, uh, there's, I think, a, a number of presidents before we get to George Washington, men like Peyton Randolph, um, that lead up to the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Constitution reflects, uh, most importantly, an Anglican view. The U.S. Constitution, specifically the First Amendment, represents an Anglican view on the freedom of worship. Okay, so in the beginning of this talk, we talked about how the Puritans had their blue letter laws. Right? You're allowed to worship however you want as long as it's according to Puritan ways of worshiping. Right? It's like Henry Ford saying, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Uh, but when we get to the American Constitution, we have the First Amendment uh, from the Bill of Rights and establishing the freedom of worship. Uh, this amendment is not as permissive as... Uh, many people think, right? It doesn't guarantee uh, freedom of religious anything. What it does is it guarantees freedom for the establishment of religious groups and for the freedom to worship, providing that no part of the ritual or doctrine is in direct uh, violation of the federal covenant or the federal law. Uh, what's interesting here is the Constitution is written in a time when all of these colonial established churches still exist. Right, so Maryland is still a state church. Uh, Virginia is still a state church. So what, one of the ways that modern people read the Constitution of uh, the, is that this prohibits states from having any religious identity. What it prevented was the federal government from going and forcing a uh, religious identity. Virginia's religious identity continued for years. Okay, so uh, this is different than... Uh, the, the William, uh, Williams idea of separation of church and state. Now, we have the, the Society of Propagation of the Gospel, creates all these churches, raises all this money. We have the 
Anglican Church siding with a great majority with the American colonists for the revolution. We have the establishment of a new Anglican Church called the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. And we have new bishops. We have a convention, its own prayer book. Uh, this is a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. The American Revolution does uh, a powder keg of change to American Anglicanism and creates and cements the colonial view of Anglicanism into America, which is at this time now because of their, of, of their uh, prosperity and future is going to explode with population. And so after White and Provost were consecrated, the American church is really set up for success. Right, think about all of the immigration that's about to happen. Uh, think about all of the, the spiritual renewal that's about to happen. Uh, so the Episcopal Church, with its constitution, uh, which was largely patterned after the U.S. Constitution, with its officers, which were largely the men who penned the U.S. Constitution, uh, sees its rise coincide with the rise of the American country. Uh, <clears throat> So let's, let's talk a little bit about what was it about the American Episcopal Church that allowed it to ascend, because it's going to ascend, to by the time we get to the 1950s, uh, to be an Episcopalian uh, is not just uh, one of the many religions. It is the religion to be in the United States. It's why throughout American history, Episcopalianism is the religion of the presidents. Uh, it's a religion of affluence, of, of American prosperity. Some of that's changed in the last 50 years. Uh, but what made uh, American Episcopalianism great was its inclusion of its prayer book and its identity as uh, vestry and clergy, right? So they had this great balance where bishops and the laity made up the convention in a way that was uh, paralleled to the way that the constitution kept the legislative and the judicial and the executive bodies all balanced. So with that said, um, though they have this great start and we know that, that the climax in the 1950s is going to be they become the premier church, the church that begins following the American Revolution is incredibly weak. Incredibly weak. So the Anglican Church existed in all 13 colonies, but it was there because of death of its ministers in the war, because of expatriation, um, there were only 200 deacons and priests for the entire United States. So remember that Society for Propagation of Gospel had, had raised all of this money to bring in 100 new people, 100 new priests to serve these churches. And then after the war is over, we're down to just 200 left. The Revolutionary War operated in uh, this sense of borrowing money uh, to pay for the war. And so it forced the church to change how it funded its clergy. So prior to Revolutionary War, the crown paid the clergy. <laughs> Taxes were collected from the Commonwealth to pay the clergy, that type of thing. Uh, after the Re Revolutionary War, you have a bankrupt borrowed negative <laughs> capital, right? So um, the Revolutionary War had left the church without funds often without buildings because Anglican church would be a good target to burn down uh, if you're fighting England. Uh, partisan politics obviously had split congregations. You had those who were loyalists and those who were revolutionaries. Um, you had a wave of anti-religious feeling sweeping the nation, right? After all, the, the, the Revolutionary War proves that religion shouldn't be used for govern, governing a free people. We should go back to those enlightenment principles. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, the anti-British feeling remained uh, with the colony for many years and continues even to today. You know, when I say that we're Anglicans or you know, Church of England, that anti-British sentiment still lives, even though most Americans don't quite understand the context of their sentiment. And the new bishops as wise and as smart as they may have been, as great theologians they have been, they were not natural leaders. Uh, these men who were set up to be the first three bishops of the Episcopal Church were not charismatic church planners. Uh, they were not Billy Graham tent revivalists. Uh, 
They were not even good speakers like George Whitfield, right? So the church enters into uh, a very difficult situation. And so there are a couple of figures who really establish American Anglicanism to get it from these really humble and broken beginnings to where it is. And there's a lot to learn here. But four names I want you to, to know as far as American Anglicanism is uh, Griswold, Hobart. Uh, so Griswold, Hobart, Moore, and Chase. So these are the four men who Anglican historians or American historians believe really took the Episcopal Church from 200 to prominence. You know, there's not a lot of time here between the 1780s and the 1950s. And what they do here is largely what the American Episcopal Church, the American Anglicans, ACNA, whatever continuing Anglicans, we need to recapture what they had here. So uh, Alexander Griswold, his parents were farmers. Uh, his education was gathered from reading his uncle's library, but his uncle was a priest and a devout churchman, and he himself had trained Griswold to be a clergyman. And, you know, this is at a time when you'd study by firelight. And so in 19, I mean, sorry, in 1794, Griswold gave up farming and signed up to be ordained as a deacon and then a priest. And so for nine years, Griswold serves in small rural parishes throughout Connecticut. And he did what I do. Uh, he taught at schools to support himself financially. Uh, he went there from Connecticut to Rhode Island, where he got a promotion to teach there in Bristol, and he received the whopping annual, annual salary of $600. Again, dividing his uh, parish work between the church itself and leading a parish school. Important point. Okay, these early men give us a, a very significant example that the way that they established themselves in ministry was through parochial education. In fact, Griswold was so successful that he went from being a parish administrator, you know, running a school and a church, uh, to bishop because of how successful he had been at his school. Now, there, there's uh, some important history history here too, but his work in the parish was so successful that when the Bishop of Rhode Island died, he was elected and consecrated by those uh, founding bishops, White and Provost. And since there were four other dioceses which could not support a bishop alone, they pulled their resources together and Griswold became the bishop of what would be called the Eastern Diocese. Um, so this is an interesting part of American history too, because Christianity from basically Constantine to now, bishops are respected authorities, right? They have the cathedral, they have status, they have retirement, right? They have uh, accolades that come with the title of being bishop. But the church in America was in such dire straits that this guy had to gather up four separate dioceses. They had to all pull their money together so that they could support the one bishop. Now, you might think, okay, great, he has a salary because of these four dioceses, but he still had to serve as rector in his home parish while being the bishop of these four dioceses. And he had to make up for two centuries of back confirmations, right? Because remember from the, Re from the revolution backwards all the way to Jamestown, no bishops, no confirmations. And so in his first year, he visited every parish in all four dioceses at least once. Uh, remarkable, but confirmed there over a thousand people in his first year. So this is, this is somebody who understands that you either have to run and make it or the church will fail. Now, uh, when the presiding bishop, so presiding bishop is a term that the Episcopal Church decided to use instead of archbishop, but it was basically the head of the general convention, the, the top bishop, and this guy was elected. When the presiding bishop, White, who was the one who was consecrated by the Church of England after Seabury, when he died, Griswold, the school teacher, made bishop, who did the thousand confirmations, 
uh, became presiding bishop, a job that he didn't want <laughs> and that he didn't much care for. Uh, but before his death, he gathered up enough churches. He encouraged enough church planting and growth that the church in Vermont uh, became strong enough to establish its own bishop. And so in his reign, he's able to pull out Vermont out of the Eastern Diocese and establish it itself as its own diocese, which is a remarkable thing for a bishop to do. It sets this wonderful example that the desire of a bishop is not to consolidate space, to, to hold territory, but to grow and let it go. And so uh, that's a strong example that we'll see followed throughout the growth years of the Episcopal Church, that uh, he wants the diocese to grow and become self-sustaining. He wants it to grow and become independent. It doesn't belong to him. It would serve better if they had their own bishop in their own area. So uh, his zeal, his, his zeal for the church that by the time he died, uh, he had bequeathed the church five dioceses and five times as many parishes as there when he began his work. So this man who just running a school becomes bishop, gathers these dioceses together, runs his church plus every year is visiting <laughs> hundreds of other churches, grows the church five dioceses. And the number of churches grows five times over. So this is uh, the dream of Episcopal uh, missions here. Now, and that is against the sentiment of all of his obstacles. You know, how can we trust this church, this anti-British sentiment? This is in a realm where religious identity is waning. And the last thing someone wants to become is an Anglican. So, significant example. Uh, next one I want to mention is uh, John Henry Hobart. And so Hobart was very different from Griswold. Where Griswold was quiet and unassuming, Hobart was powerful, persuasive, and he was described by those who worked for him as a bit of a dictator. Now, he was born of well-to-do parents and was educated at Princeton. And <clears throat> his family forced him into business but he didn't like it. And so, as you might guess from the description of him so far, his personality persuaded him to do something else. So he returned back to Princeton as a tutor, and he experienced uh, a religious conversion, sought, off to, sought out to become ordained, and then became the assistant at Trinity Church in New York. Remember, this is the, the very well-endowed church with all of its property that's now basically Wall Street. And so he goes and becomes a deacon, at, at an assistant at this very well-established church, and was made secretary of the House of Bishops of the uh, Episcopal com uh, of the Episcopal uh, Conference or, or uh, Convention. Now, this is uh, significant, and it reminds me really of of Saint Athanasius. Um, not that that Hobart has the same um, reputation, but we see young men. Uh, in this case, much younger than me, uh, who are passionate about taking responsibility. And so Hobart wasn't looking for the accolades or the paycheck. He was assistant. He was secretary. He served even when it was unusual for a deacon to do this, much like Athanasius, who is this upstart deacon at the uh, Council of Nicaea, talking to the bishops and archbishops. Uh, but because of that, at 26 years old, Hobart became a member of the Board of Trustees at Columbia College. Remember, that was the King's College established. And he was there with uh, Alexander Hamilton and others. Hobart was described as having unlimited energy. And uh, he was one of the leading members promoting the society for the promoting religion and learning in the state of New York. So these are kind of these... Uh, religious institutions that exist throughout uh, Anglicanism, you, like the Society for Propagation of Gospel. And these uh, societies really are what get at the grassroots of the learning institutions. So 
these men recognized that at Princeton or other schools, the next generation of leaders needed to be captured now. So they started these, what we might describe today as clubs, where they were talking about the values and principles and spiritual disciplines and ideas of Anglicanism as a way to capture the imagination of the next generation. You know, it wasn't about you know, sustaining the, the organization, but capturing the imagination of those who could lead next. Uh, it's an important. He took over the Churchman's Magazine, and uh, he was its editor for three years. So he's trying to capture the influence in the institution of learning, writing and promulgating the Churchman perspective. He also established the Bible and Common Prayer Book Society and was the first American churchman to produce religious writings. So becomes America's theologian in a way. Uh, his book on the defense of the episcopacy brought, a, brought lots of criticism from the Presbyterians, but he was able to uh, communicate effectively through writing, uh, through these clubs, and uh, this is really needed with American Anglicanism today. People who are willing to take uh, this, this heritage that we have and communicate it again in a fresh perspective. Think about uh, examples today. Who, who is running, running the prayer book societies today? Uh, who is trying to teach the next generation through writing and articles about what we have to offer as an Anglican theology? So that, that's where Hobart started. You know, he, wasn't a, he wasn't going uh, trying to match the culture. He was trying to teach and reintroduce the historical heritage that the Anglican Church had, even writing on their church government. So, 1811, Hobart succeeded Benjamin Moore as rector at Trinity Church. So he becomes this rector, or the senior pastor at an established church. And in his first year, uh, I'm sorry, succeeded Benjamin Moore as rector of Trinity Church and became the bishop of New York. In his first year as the diocesan bishop, he traveled 2,000 miles, visited 33 parishes, and confirmed over a thousand people. See, this is, uh, again, a recognition that once he got to the bishop's rank, his responsibility was to do even more. Uh, he took that role and traveled 2,000 miles. Now, 2,000 miles doesn't seem like much today in Boeing 747, but this is horseback. This is uh, buggage and Buggage, uh, horse and buggy. <laughs> um, so these these are significant things, and again, these are people who work their way up in the hierarchy, and it's supposed to get easier, right? And yet these men are doing more and more. And part of his role he saw in in the space as the bishop of New York was to improve what he had, not to sustain, but to grow. And so he spread the diocese throughout New York, and he demanded uh, that the church establish new seminaries. And so General Theological Seminary, uh, which is not, a, not really held the line in the last uh, few decades, but historically has been a significant seminary for Anglicans in the United States, uh, was founded by Hobart. And uh, he also established, of course, Hobart College. But this is, uh, this is an important part that he recognized not only we have to capture the current religious institutions of Princeton at that time, but also to establish new institutions. And he did this all before reaching 50, uh, when at uh, 48 his health failed, and so he took uh, to Europe to try to regain his health, um, but never quite was the same dictator that he was in his early years as rector. But he died at 55, doing exactly what he'd done for the other years of his episcopacy on a missionary journey on the western part of New York. Today he's still buried under the chancel at uh, Trinity uh, Parish Church. But this is, again, to highlight the growth of the Episcopal Church was due to these type of efforts. His accomplishments were tremendous, and he gave the church a living power and he proved that the office uh, of the bishop was meant to be a missionary office, not an administrative, not, not a, a executive 
but a missionary office. Next one I want to talk about is Richard Channing Moore. And so Moore was born in New York, and he was uh, well-educated. He became a doctor, and he started his practice of medicine in New York City, where he was uh, very successful at being a medical doctor. And this is uh, not surprising. Christians have long had a history of being good doctors. Look at St. Luke, right? Uh, but he was ordained uh, after a similar experience. He went through and was a successful doctor, but had a religious conversion, felt that he needed to do something that only he knew why, but he decided to devote his entire life uh, to the church. And so in 1787, he was ordained both a deacon and priest by Bishop Provost, who was one of those original three. And he served at St. Andrew's Parish in Staten Island, and then later at St. Stephen's in New York City. But in his work here at both of these parishes, he grew the churches. He was well known for his uh, preaching and faithfulness to the prayer book tradition. And so in 1814, he was elected Bishop of Virginia and rector of the church, uh, the monumental church there in Ru and Redmond, uh, Richmond. Uh, <laughs> but again, so 1814, this is not terribly long after the revolution. And so he took over as the diocesan bishop of what? What do you imagine is in Virginia, which gets the brunt of uh, British invasion, right? So what's there after uh, the re revolution? It says that he took over half, half a dozen active priests and the diocese had received the name, not of um, the, the diocese of Virginia, but of the diocese of discouragement. Right. So many of our American churches, uh, I know in the ACNA or, or the continuing church, could take this title, right? The Diocese of Discouragement. We've lost legal battles or we've lost members or our churches aren't growing. You have more <laughs> than a half dozen active priests. I I'm sure of it. And uh, <laughs> more is a good example here because uh, nothing could discourage him. And in two years, he filled 20 church vacancies and had confirmed 750 people. So do the math, from six to 20, all right? Uh, or six plus 20, I should say. That, that's a, a huge growth for a diocese, and in two years time. So he was very interested in getting men into the order. I know some diocese where two years, maybe you'd be a good, qual maybe you'd be a good candidate for postulancy after that much time. But here he is recognizing and ordaining uh, leaders. Now, more as a personality was vibrant, dynamic, and a tremendous preacher. This, there's a story that's told that one afternoon, after Moore concluded his service, uh, one of the people in the congregation stood and said, Dr. Moore, the people are not disposed to go home. Please give us another sermon. Now, I've only been preaching for you know four or five years, and that's never happened to me. Uh, and I don't imagine that that's going to happen anytime soon. But that says something uh, about the people at this time. Now, maybe it's because they didn't have Netflix at this time. But loved by the people that he made them crave more preaching. Now, when's the last time uh, you've heard the church planting seminar or the church guru or the purpose-driven church thing say, what you really need to do to grow your church is to have two sermons. <laughs> Right, that's, that's never on there. But uh, Moore then goes on, not to just deliver one more, but two more sermons that day, uh, and then had to beg the people to leave because he himself was personally exhausted. Now, Moore added 20 clergy, but recognized that Virginia needed new clergymen. So what does he do? He founded the Virginia Theological Seminary. And uh, at the time of his death, the church had grown from six priests to 100 active priests and serving 170 congregations. The Diocese of Discouragement had become one of the most successful dioceses in the Episcopal Church in the United States in his lifetime. Now, that's, I think that's a significant uh, achievement and worthy uh, to be modeled and followed and studied by modern Anglicans, which 
I'm not sure that, that many American Anglicans know who Moore is. Now, Philander Chase is the last name I want to uh, focus on here, are these big four. Now, Chase was uh, the most picturesque man ever consecrated bishop. And uh, so he was a, a pioneer man, a Paul Bunyan man. He was rude, rugged, restless, and he was described as, quote, consumed with the desire to plant the church everywhere. <laughs> and so Chase unlike all the other men, is from New Hampshire, and he spent all of his life studying crops and the field and farming. And interestingly, this is really what helped him understand church planting. He was a farming guy. And so during his spare time growing up uh, and during his college years at Dartmouth, uh, he was a man of agricultural studies. But then in his sophomore year, uh, which at this time he is going through his sophomore year at Dartmouth in 1789. The American Prayer Book is published and he gets a copy there at Dartmouth. He studies it and this farm boy who had never been part of the Church of England becomes Episcopalian from reading this newly published book. This newly published book. Uh, so he becomes Episcopalian and tells his family, hey, we should all be Episcopalians. And they agree. And so uh, during his college days, he served as a lay reader. And after he graduated from Dartmouth, he traveled to New York and he meets the Reverend Ellison. Uh, and Ellison has this young man show up at his door asking to be instructed for ordination. You know, apprentice me to become a priest. And in less than two years, he was ordained a deacon. And for a year and a half, he uh, taught school in New York and traveled himself over 4,000 miles, preached over 200 sermons, baptized 319 infants and 14 adults, all before being ordained a priest. Uh, so again, take a, take a moment and say, uh, what do our deacons do? What do, we, what do we expect of them to do? Um, and so we have, we have this young man here, 300, 300 baptisms as a deacon. That's remarkable. And uh, 200 sermons. Also, I, I don't think I can name any deacon who's done 200 sermons in their lifetime. Now, when he was ordained a priest, he was made, uh, he was sent to New Orleans. Uh, so when he arrived in New Orleans, he was the first non-Roman Catholic clergyman to enter the city. Uh, so they took this country boy from New Hampshire, who had studied at Dartmouth, who had come through New York and sent him out as a priest to Louisiana. And in six years, he had founded Christ Church Cathedral, established a parish school, and grown the parish to being self-supporting. Now, again, do you notice here, all of these men, in order for them to grow the church, recognize Education is an essential part of it. Whether it's seminaries or parish schools, teachers, Anglicans have always put Christian education as a fundamental part of church growth. And anytime you see the church growing historically, it's connected with Christian school teachers. So uh, that's just a note there. And if you want, to if you're interested in supporting a Christian school that's trying to do that in California, uh, go to Canterbury Christian School, where we have a, a staff of Anglican teachers here. No, so from Louisiana though, after he establishes the cathedral there, uh, he goes to Ohio. And so by the age of 42, uh, which, you know, at this time is middle of life for, for men, and where men were starting to establish, this is where I'm going to work, this is where I'm going to raise a family, this is where I'm going to settle down. He became more missionary, more full of zeal than ever before. But his zeal didn't match the budget. So he wanted to go plant a bunch of churches, but the Episcopal Church did not have a bunch of money. And so <laughs> there was obviously that conflict. So he left his family, uh, his, his bride and his children in Hartford, and took the stage to Albany. And he made the trip across the ice of Lake Erie to reach Salem, 
And all during the spring, he traveled by horseback over bad roads, uh, either crossing snow or oozing mud, and established communities all throughout Ohio, in Windsor, Zanesville, Ravenna, and Columbus, all by himself with his family off in a different place. And he's doing this over the winter months. When summer came, uh, he bought a farm in Worthington and established himself as a minister on the farm. <laughs> and uh, this makes sense because of his background, right? Before he went to Dartmouth, he was the agriculture boy. But he then became the principal of the newly established academy at Worthington. So, not enough resources, can't get the farm to pay for him. And so he establishes a Christian school, lets him, sets himself up as the headmaster, and that is how he supports the work there, by training the students. Finally, in 1818, he becomes the Bishop of Ohio, a diocese that he can be credited with winter after winter, establishing by horseback, yet took no salary as bishop and took care of five churches as rector. So that means that not only is he bishop for all of Ohio, there are five churches that he is responsible for leading the vestry at and is the rector of, all while also working on the farm to provide for his family and establishing himself as president of the Cincinnati Ohio College. So here's a remarkable guy who's not just bivocational, but trivocational. He's a bishop, he's a rector, he's a farmer, he's a teacher, he's a college president, and he has a family. Uh, it really shows how uh, zealous he was for the purpose of growing the church, and uh, yet uh, he recognized that he needed to find new people to fill in the spaces where he was doing all of these roles. While he was a great charismatic leader, if he were to die, all of this would be for naught. And so he understood that there was a desperate need for clergy, uh, not just in Ohio, uh, but all throughout this whole missionary Western world. And so he went to England to raise funds. And when he came back, he founded Bexley Hall and Kenyon College. And as the college president, he... <laughs> He treated all of the staff and children like, like his own children. And uh, as a, an example, uh, there was a song that was, that was said at, the, at Bexley Hall and Kenyon College about him that went like this. The first of Kenyon's goodly race was the great man Philander Chase. He climbed the hill and said a prayer and founded Kenyon College there. He built the college, built the dam, milked the cow, he smoked the ham, he taught the classes, rang the bell, he spanked the naughty freshman well. Right, so this was recognized that the one guy who is zealous enough for the church can make a huge difference. Uh, but he wanted to make sure that there were men to take in these places. He was going to be the trailblazer, but he needed men to continue it on. Uh, now, he was then elected... Uh, uh, bishop in Illinois in 1835 and died during his work there in Illinois. And so this is, these four men blazed the trail of the church from the colonies westward. And from here in the 1830s, you see uh, this missionary vision continued. And it happens with the invention, uh, really in the American Episcopal Church, of the idea of the missionary bishop. And Particularly, we're going to talk about uh, Jackson Kemper and uh, James Lloyd Breck. And so the convention uh, in 1835, now the convention is like uh, the synod or the, the, where the entire Episcopal Church gathers together with all of its bishops and all of the different houses of laity and clergy. But 1835 is a crucial point where they recognize that these four men have really set them up for the next phase of the Episcopal Church. We have moved past the revolution, we've reestablished ourselves uh, with these colleges, we have new men coming up, what do we do with them? Are we, what is our, our next calling to be? And so 1835, a resolution was passed providing for the election of, quote, missionary bishops 
for the frontier to establish the church. So these missionary bishops were different because um, the bishops weren't required to serve also as parish priests or erectors of their local parish, and they weren't constrained to the traditional diocesan model where uh, they had to find so many churches and make all these regular visits. They were to go out and establish to a certain area. And so the first missionary bishop established was Jackson Kemper. So Jackson Kemper was elected and assigned to the area of Missouri and Indiana. Now, at this time, Missouri and Indiana are wilderness areas. And so when he goes in there, he, the wilderness area into which Kemper went covered a great deal more territory than the two states were named. So what, what, is that, what, what I'm saying is when we think of Missouri and Indiana today, that area is actually smaller today than what was described in 1835. Those were larger territories. Um, so not only did he make out to that area, but he also worked in uh, Wisconsin and made visitations to the states along the Mississippi. He went all the way down to the Gulf and South Atlantic coasts. And his district was wild, unsettled areas. This is the bishop going from log cabin to log cabin, uh, going across impassable roads, uh, whereas bishops in England might be taken to tea. He is fighting wild animals, uh, preventing the Indians from taking away you know, whatever possessions or money he has with him. But he traveled not only there, but back to Louisiana, uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, uh, visiting parishes, but also uh, offering confirmations. He made expeditions, meaning he went into to share the gospel and hope to establish churches in Kansas, Illinois, and Iowa. And he supported those churches that were already starting to form in those areas by you know, men like Chase. Now, uh, <laughs> by the end of his, his territory here, uh, he was also called to serve in Wisconsin. So the General Convention added Wisconsin, Iowa into his jurisdiction, and that's where he established the Oneida Mission at Green Bay and started to develop the need to recruit volunteers to help him with his missionary bishop work. And so in Wisconsin, uh, the men that Jackson Kemper you know, conscripts into this missionary work are John Henry Hobart Jr. and James Lloyd Breck. Now, of course, you can guess who <laughs> Hobart Jr. is related to, but this is the first time we've mentioned uh, Breck. Now, the two men that went with Kemper uh, were from General Seminary, and they built small wooden houses at Neshota Lakes in Wisconsin. And the six men studied for ministry, and this was the beginning of the Episcopal Seminary we know today as the uh, Neshota House. Um, and, you know, you could still visit Neshota today, but it began as this uh, missionary seminary outpost where this missionary bishop was given too much territory. <laughs> and so he brought some guys in from the other seminary and in some cabins established a wilderness outpost. Now, this sounds strange and far-fetched, but Kemper was actually would actually prove to be one of the greatest missionaries of all time, uh, not just in Episcopal history, but uh, largely in Christendom. Uh, throughout his efforts, seven dioceses were established, uh, the Diocese of Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, Missouri, Wisconsin, Nebraska, and Indiana. Uh, he didn't resign as missionary bishop until 1859, but then he spent the next 11 years after that uh, working in his own diocese in Kansas. Uh, when he died at the age of 80, there's this huge legacy of all of these new dioceses throughout the Midwest uh, of the United States that exist largely because of his impetus. Now, Breck, uh, who followed, uh, followed Kemper out into Neshota, uh, was part of this steady stream of missionary bishops from the Episcopal Church. And so someone had got it into the minds of the General Convention that the future of the Episcopal Church depended on missionaries, which in the next century they're going to lose. Uh, and 
hopefully it's been reignited through churches like the uh, the continuing churches and the Anglican churches of North America and the Reformed Episcopal Church and their church planning efforts. But this is this is an act of the convention to send men like Whipple and Breck and Scott and uh, Kip and throughout really all of the western states. So as far as California, and this is you know middle of the 19th century, there goes from no Episcopal churches west of the colonies to now they're going to ter establish territories in every state. So following Breck, uh, following Kemper, uh, James Lloyd Breck, one of those seminarians brought to Wisconsin, went to Minnesota and established two missions along the Chippewa Indians. So Breck begins with a local outreach to the Indians. It's, you know, a recurring story. You know, Jamestown did the same type of thing with Pocahontas, right? So there's a, there's a cycle in the growth of the church that we should pay attention to. But while Breck never himself became a bishop, he did exactly what our other examples have done. He established a seminary at Faribault, which he named after Bishop Seabury, the first bishop. Um, and that seminary was eventually moved to Evanston, Illinois, and combined with Western Seminary, and I think they still have some type of program uh, going on today. But Breck went out there, established that seminary, and eventually was sent all the way to California to establish new parishes, new missions. Now, uh, the next man who is a frontier church planter is James Harvey Odie. And so the American Episcopal Church move forward with some of these key figures. Uh, James Odie started his ministry in Tennessee, where he served as a parish priest, as well as the headmaster of the parish school. When the Diocese of Tennessee was organized in 1834, he became its first missionary bishop. Uh, his territory in Tennessee covered 4,000 miles through the South and the Southwest Indian Territory. Odie was described as a tall, striking man uh, with tremendous appeal. And you're starting to recognize we're getting close to a, another significant event in American history. So 1830s in Tennessee, we're getting close to the American war between the states, the, the Civil War. And while he was opposed to se secession initially, he supported the Southern cause. And this kind of respect uh, this kind of respect he inspired in people is well illustrated by the fact that General Sherman did not feel it necessary to make him take the oath of allegiance as the other southern leaders, southern leaders were asked to do. So that you can see uh, that the Odie here, this headmaster who has become bishop, who is now serving in the Episcopal Church, which at the time of the Civil War splits. There's a new prayer book even written where you have the Episcopal Church of the Confederate States, uh, Protestant Episcopal Church of the Confederate States, with its own prayer book in the South and the same in the North. And uh, this is uh, a testimony of, of Odie's strength as an Episcopalian, that by the time he dies in 1863, that he is remembered and recognized and venerated largely by contemporaries in both the North and the South uh, because of his contributions to the diocese. Now, after the, after the war, these uh, churches reunite again, uh, but he is, he is recognized as an important bishop, as the first bishop of, of Tennessee for establishing that diocese and preserving it through uh, what was a very difficult time in American history. Now, uh, throughout the South, there's a couple of other states that have important uh, bishops. Uh, bishop of Arkansas and Texas was George Washington Freeman. Uh, and he, his diocese also included the surrounding Indian territory. And his work was so successful that five years into it, he was able to create the Diocese of Texas. And so I hope you are starting to recognize that these men who put their hand to the plow, who are given these huge swaths of territory, uh, that God's blessing their work, that where they're putting down the prayer book and uh, putting down the prayer book for the people to read and follow, they're experiencing great success and growth uh, so much that these dioceses are exploding. So when you see a new diocese 
show up in the history here, it means that there was enough churches, enough people being converted, enough buildings being formed, communities being established that they could support, uh, according to the Constitution and Canons, a bishop ordinary. So they're, they're significant not just because they came up with a bishop, but because the bishop is a reflection of the growth being seen in this area to make it its own um, diocese, uh, which uh, is a big deal in the in the convention because once you make this guy a bishop, he's equal to the other bishops in the Episcopal Church. So they had certain standards for what it meant to uh, uh, to welcome in a new bishop. Now, uh, a couple of names that might be familiar with to you are William Ingram Kipp, uh, who was the missionary bishop to California and where he worked directly with men like Brick. Uh, and Ingram wrote a, or Kip, Ingram Kip wrote a wonderful diary of all of his work in California, which is obviously really relevant to me because this is where I am. But about his ministry is that he's coinciding with really gold rush in California. And so he talks about going to saloons and, and ministering to minors. Um, of, of, of precious metals, not young children, but ministering to minors and just experiencing great success in California up to the point where California itself becomes its own diocese. So uh, fantastic work. Um, there is a couple of other missionary bishops who are worth mentioning, uh, like Thomas F. Scott, who was sent to Oregon Territory, right? So you remember the Oregon Trail? Uh, even the bishops went up the Oregon Trail, and so Scott, Bishop Scott, organized Oregon and Idaho Territory. And then Joseph Talbot was elected missionary bishop of the Northwest in uh, 1859. And this care covered most of the Dakotas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and Wyoming. Wyoming. So those of you watching who are not familiar with uh, United States geography will not recognize that this is like three quarters of a million miles of geographical territory. Uh, and so uh, he received the nickname, the Bishop of All Outdoors, because <laughs> there's not many people uh, in this territory. Uh, but even though he received this large swath, his response was to ask for more. And so <laughs> he asked for uh, to go to New Mexico and Arizona, you know, even greater territory. And again, this is un conquered wild terrain. This is no railroads, there's uh, no roads, uh, and you're dealing with natives and wild animals and inclement weather. Often these territories have very difficult winters. Um, in 1865, the, he graphically pointed out to the General Convention that one bishop uh, could not hope to cover all of this area. on, And so he told them the story about how he traveled on horseback, uh, these fantastic dip distances, you know, 600 miles from Nebraska to Colorado or a thousand, another thousand miles from there to Montana. And that, you know, this was an impossible uh, bishop and that <laughs> it was as impossible. And because you've now been brought up on the history, he says his job as the Bishop of All, door of all Outdoors was just as impossible as what the Bishop of London was supposed to oversee in the American colonies. And so, uh, and he's right. I mean, the, ter the territory of the colonies was much smaller, uh, maybe a fifth or a small fraction of a fifth uh, than this territory where he is called to see. Now, what we see throughout here, though, is the establishment of, of new dioceses all throughout uh, the late 19th century, and what this gives birth to is the growth of the Episcopal Church. Um, and the growth of the Episcopal Church happened through the development of parish planting and these missionary bishops. And the growth and the expansion uh, was also supported not just by the missionary bishops, but also by the development of other trends in the Episcopal Church. So things like monastic orders were reestablished thanks to what happened uh, through the establishment of Neshota House. Uh, there were organizations that were founded, like Women's Auxiliary, that supported the work of the church. And each of these uh, missionary bishops, even though they moved on to their next project, left behind them institutions 
churches and schools that raised up new leaders to grow the church. So while their life and the timeline was linear, their impact was really exponential because they would move from one state to another, but leave everything behind intact and growing. Very important, very important. Uh, you see that a hymnal was written for the church. Uh, church school, again, is emphasized. Uh, missionary districts following the establishment of these new dioceses are established. Um, provisions were made for assisting bishops, so the number of bishops continues to grow. Uh, clergy were now not just bivocational, but they had pensions and other support systems meant to serve them from the establishment of these growing churches. Uh, the office of the presiding bishop was made uh, elective, meaning that it wasn't like a, a span of time you served as, uh, I mean, it wasn't a permanent position to be the archbishop, but you were elected by the, uh, by the convention of the Episcopal Church. Uh, work started not just for seminaries, but also for undergraduate and graduate school programs. Uh, the prayer book was uh, revised during this period. Uh, there was minor revisions in the 19th century, and then a major revision uh, in 1928, uh, which is the prayer book still used at this parish. There were provisions made for prayer books for the Army and Navy. Um, there were chaplains appointed for the Army and Navy. And so all throughout... Uh, this period from the 1700s, uh, well, I guess all the way back from Sir Thomas, uh, from Sir Francis Drake, all the way here to the missionary bishops, you see the church growing and advancing. But uh, what you also see is a movement of ecumenism born in the 20th century, where not only is there uh, a growth of uh, the Episcopal Church itself, but with that stature comes the recognition of the Anglican Church as an apostolic body that carries some weight. And so we see the Orthodox Church, uh, particularly the Greeks and the Russians and the Antiochians, measuring to whether or not the Ang Anglican Church is apostolic. And overtures and, and gestures made to perhaps recognize what was lost at the Reformation uh, as far as the relationships between the Roman and the Orthodox churches. Now, one of the, one of the uh, parts that is kind of uh, happening at the same time outside of the American church that's growing and exploding at this time uh, is the growth of the Anglican church as a worldwide communion. So where the American church is, uh, where the American nation is spreading west from the colonies and developing more and more states westward, uh, Britain, or the British as a empire, are doing the same worldwide. And everywhere they go, just like what happened in the American colonies, the prayer book is being established in these other places as well. And so Anglicans are being formed throughout Africa, um, throughout Australia, throughout India, and uh, even South America, where Anglican communities are being formed in very much the same way as the American colonies. And a movement is underway uh, during the 20th century to make these churches autocephalous. In the same way that Seabury and, and White became these initial bishops of the independent, uh, self-governing church in the United States, the Anglican Church of England wanted to do the same thing for a lot of these uh, self, uh, self, to create self-governing churches around the world. So it looks different um, around the world, but for example, you know, you have England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, right? So, um, all right next to each other. But each country is a different church in the Anglican communion. You've got the Church of England, Church of Wales, the Church of Ireland, the Scottish Episcopal Church, right? So these four churches make a communion where they recognize each other, uh, but yet they're distinct religious organizations, own bishops, own priests, yet in communion with each other. They add in the other groups like the United States. But you see that the rest of the English territories, the wherever else the British Empire spread, the same trend follows. So Canada uh, goes from being uh, the Church of England in Canada to the Anglican Church of Canada, right? And so the similar type of self-governing jurisdiction is handed off to the bishops of Canada uh, and throughout the rest of the British Empire, whether it's India or Pakistan, Burma, 
Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, the West Indies, Japan, China, uh, even Brazil and Argentina. Uh, we see all of these Anglican jurisdictions become national churches. So much that today, the largest Anglican church outside of England is Nigeria. So Nigeria, which was once a colonial church, is now you know, the, the powerhouse of the Anglican South. So they have their own archbishops, they have their own <laughs> colleges, they have their own uh, style of worship even. Uh, but all together, those groups that hold together under this history, shared history, shared apostolic succession, shared prayer book heritage, shared affinity and faith, uh, make up a communion of, of global Anglican churches. Now, a lot of what holds them together was established there at the end of the 19th century uh, at Lambeth, uh, at the, with the Lambeth quadrilater quadrilateral. And this were the essential principles of what it meant to be part of the uh, Anglican communion. And so, unlike Rome or the orthodoxy uh, of, of you know, the Russian or the Greek variety, uh, what you see in Anglicanism is a diffusion of authority, that there is a, a synodality or a conciliarity between the various ecclesiastical bodies within Anglicanism, where every bishop and every archbishop are equal, that the smallest unit of the church is the diocese. And so what Lambeth does, rather than centralizing the authority around the Archbishop of Canterbury, like a pope, is it decentralizes it. Now that's created some problems when various churches have gone into liberalism or humanism or, or whatever variety of, of theological aberration you don't like. But Lambeth called them back to a common faith uh, in 1888 of essential principles that the Holy Scriptures were to be the standard of the faith, that the apostles and Nicene creeds were to be the statements of our faith. Those were to circumscribe what it meant to understand the scripture. And the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion with Christ's words of institution were necessary for salvation. And to recognize that the episcopate, you know, the line of bishops was historically necessary. Uh, and that we needed to recognize our apostolic succession is part of what makes us Anglican. Now, uh, the church in America, of course, has a strange trajectory. It starts off with... In one sense, one priest on an open-air altar in Jamestown, right? The sail between the trees. But by the 1950s, it has 10,000 parishes. It has missions in every state uh, beyond its borders. It has tens of thousands of clergy, uh, memberships of over 3 million um, it's a tragedy uh, that Anglicanism today is divided in America between the Episcopal and the, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in North America, between the continuing churches and uh, the various jurisdictional alphabet soup that exists. But uh, concerned churchmen can recognize that the path towards growth or rebuilding uh, has happened once before. And much like the time after the Revolutionary War. Anglicans today have the option to reside in the Diocese of Discouragement, to give up or to expatriate, or to put their hand to the plow. And I think that we have a, a great legacy in the prayer book to preserve. I think our liturgy is worth passing on to our children. And I think the way forward is through our parish schools, faithful preaching, and missionary efforts. Uh, this has been a history of, uh, of American uh, Episcopalianism, and um, while I'd like to go in through 1950 to today, I think that would probably deserve its own very well-nuanced video uh, to give it justice. Thank you.